Hey, what's up guys and girls? Pat here with another deck profile. This one is for Chilai Maidens, uh, Henshin 2.0, if you will. You guys remember in the Tournament of Power, I made a deck called Henshin.deck, which was based around the Maidens. Henshin being obviously the Japanese for transformation. Um, so yeah, I basically set out with this deck. The purpose was to play something at my locals that kind of proved the point that set seven is a different beast entirely. You fundamentally have to change your thought process and the way you play the game uh, in order to succeed and I wanted to see if I could play something that was basically meme-tastic uh, and try to actually win with it uh, by using a lot of counterplay effects and a lot of things that just naturally counter what people are trying to play. So I jokingly said Wednesday night uh, that I wanted to do this and I mentioned it to Chris Welch with shout outs to him. This would not have happened without him. This is you know largely his shell. Um, you know, I mentioned I wanted to play Maidens for fun because I thought it would be really funny. I was like, what's the most meme-worthy thing I can do that I could take to a field where people are trying to you know, get last-minute practice in for prelims and pro play tour Philadelphia and are probably going to be playing stuff that's incredibly meta. So I said Maidens because it would be funny, and he came out with a shell, and then the next day I kind of test-handed it and kind of changed about 10 or 15 cards or so to get it kind of where I wanted it, but the overall strategy and archetype you know largely started with you know me and him conversing and him putting it together so again thank you chris it would not have happened without you um so yeah the overall play style and reason i built the deck obviously is you just are playing a draw go game very similar to how you would play control and magic you are basically using free wishes to develop your board while you just sit back on counter spells and negates uh and just kind of block everything and deny everything that your opponent does and eventually you just kind of win the game uh, from there. So that's the basic overall play style. Um, and, you know, again, before I get into the card choices, like this is living proof. And this is 4 0 at a, like a 16 person local that, uh, you know, it works. It's, you know, you can play what you want. I mean, obviously, I don't think this deck is going to win like a pro play tour or a regional or any of that. But the point stands, at least at the local level, which is, you know, most of your games are at the local level or just like, you know, in testing with friends. Like this deck can win. It can steal games, especially off of what people are perceiving as the meta. You need, like, you know, I beat two Universe 6 Kabas and I believe two f Triple Flash decks, which is what everybody is saying is basically meta right now and is really good. Um, so, like, th this is like proof that you can just take something that's relatively unknown, completely different, and counter those uh, play styles. You really just have to be open to you know, all the new cards that are in the set and changing the way you fundamentally play the game because the way that the game has been played up until this point has been jam a guy, turn it sideways. You can no longer do that in set seven. You actually have to think and you have to keep resources open to protect your plays and yourself. You can't just be like, I'm going to just, you know, pay two energy and just jam this out. You get punished for it. And this deck is pretty much, uh, you know, a perfect example of that. So basic play style guide is search for one star ball on one, bin one of the two maidens, either Kakunsa or Rosie, uh, otherwise an excess extra card, because you'll see we have quite a lot of them, not a lot of combo power in this deck, but uh, that's because we're largely just a counter spell deck. Uh, and then on two, you're gonna play assembling the squad for free. Play line one is to get Brienne de Chateau, otherwise you get Spirited Search SS Trunks. And then you just sit on two energy for preemptive strike and deny their plays and shocking death ball to deny their plays. From there, you're basically just, you know, grinding the game out, waiting to, for it to go slightly longer, uh, evolving into big rebrand when necessary to kill any threats. And then when we once we get to the later part of the game, you either henshin or bring in Big Mama and just close out the game. So let's go over the card choices. Uh, first up is Beyond Darkness Demigra. We need, you know, at this point, you basically just should play an ultimate in most decks not every deck needs it but like it's kind of sort of becoming like overwhelm where it's like you should probably have at least one especially since bandai's design philosophy seems to be ultimate equals game winning card uh demigra since we're a dragon ball deck you know it does pretty much everything we want um it is a you know a hard closer uh it does satisfy the overwhelm you know if we do need it because our wish is basically useless in this deck outside of pulling out super combos um, and then also we are a hand destruction deck and this lends really nicely and works very well with the strategy. So that's why assembling the squad, uh, really broken card, uh, grabs either girl warrior or spirited search to basically set up our plays on starting on turn two, 
Girl Warrior again is the usual target, otherwise you do Spirited Search Trunks. Dragon Balls, don't have to explain it. Spirited Search SS Trunks, this is the backup plan for assembling the squad and it creates quite a lot of pressure. If we need to switch strategies from being a control heavy deck to an aggro deck, you can do that for sure with Spirited Search Trunks. You just play assembling the squad to get Spirited Search Trunks. If you're at four or less, you pull out the same assembling that you just had, pay two more, get another Spirited Search Trunks, pick up the same assembling a squad, and then play it again, and then get either Girl Warrior for you know the 10k barrier attacker that also gets us a 5k off the top of our deck. So yeah, it lets you just go wide out of nowhere. More often than not, what you're going to be using it for is to play assembling on three when you already have Brienne and you don't want to go into re-Brienne and then basically start recurring either assembling the squads for free value every turn by you know thinning out your deck and still drawing a card or just constantly picking up Plea for Salvation or a sideboard A Kind Wish. Next up, Shocking Death Ball. I really wish I could have four of this in the deck because this is like a lifesaver. Everyone is playing decks that are playing a lot of two and less except for the triple flash decks shocking death ball basically answers everything it's free and we usually awaken at seven to eight life most of the time so uh, our opponent's front side leader isn't really doing any damage to us so this lets us kind of you know stop their play while also recouping cards and you know count, uh, you know just developing our game state our board state as well as cards uh rebrand transformation complete this is basically our finisher uh you can tap out with this on turn four very easily just go into rebrand into this card uh and you'll be fine as long as you have you know a couple of paragus and a shocking death ball or two you should be absolutely fine um you know basically i find that most people once you preemptive strike their first play in the game they're really hesitant to commit at all to the board um and then you can really just kind of mind game them and like tap out and be like look i if i'm tapping out with rebrand like i'm proving to you that like you're not killing me so it's especially good if you've been controlling the game up to this point and you're still at six or seven life so uh really really you know strong mid game card and it does check a lot of boxes it is big enough that it gets over a denial of hope and it is also costed high enough that you know it gets around a lot of things um your opponent could mutaito i believe i'm not sure if it interacts well with mutaito that's something that came up that plus kaba uh, the Revoker, or I believe is the card's name. So I'm not 100% sure on the rulings, but it dodges most of the counterplays in the in the set, which is really important. Uh, Oob, Symbol of Hope, you're playing Chilai. This is your Dragon Ball Searcher. You have to play it. Paragus, Super Combo, have to play it. Rebrienne. So Rebrienne is the basically the core of the deck. Uh, she's a 25k single striking barrier that kills a guy when you evolve into her. Really important to note, five costs, so your opponent can't get it with any of the four cost or less uh, counterplay cards has barrier so you can't vegeta you know the cruel i know it's a five cost but like a lot of people are playing removal or counterplay removal can't do that it's also 25k so you can't denial of hope it's literally right in the sweet spot it dodges all the counters and proves the point that i was trying to make that there are ways around the counterplays for those who are saying counters are too strong and then also with preemptive strike and other stuff in the deck it proves that counters are strong enough that you have to respect them uh girl warrior brienne de chateau 10k is barrier again dodges a lot of the, the, the stuff in the format a lot of people have ways to get around uh you know if you assembling the squad they like play a counterplay and like nix your guy but it's like okay well this is barrier so unless you played either the red or the, the you know blue counterplay i'm getting it um rosie and kakunsa uh i did a 4-3 split uh, Kakunsa is a significantly better card than Rosie. That's why she has more copies of her. Because you can very easily wish this card into play off of Plea for Salvation. Uh, and, like, you know, it's just good value because it's just 20k crit. It lends itself to being aggressive as well as, you know, denying our opponent's hand size. So that's why it's at 4. And we needed green cards and also 0 5k. So um, it's just good. Rosie is significantly worse. 20k blocker is actually quite relevant. Um, though because people just don't seem to have answers main board to uh you know blockers they get triple flash like literally people are like well wasn't expecting to have to play against the blocker because it's like everybody's so all in on the i you can't negate the triple flash they forget that blocker is a mechanic so uh rosie puts in work there in that matchup uh, but overall, it's not like a card you really want to be playing hard paying for for. And it's also really not a card that you're just like enthusiastic to, you know, wish and start attacking people with. So that's why it's at less. And then next up is the extra card package. 
uh, Henshin is over here because it's just an absolute blowout. If you actually have both Rosie and Kakunsa in the, the sideboard, you could happily tap out to get this card on four. Again, if you have a Paragus and Death Ball in your hand and a reasonably high life total, because you can very easily just start jamming double Kakunsa attacks, Rosie protects you, and then also Rubrian now suddenly becomes a mini Brawly and starts just removing two cards from your opponent's hand every turn. So, yeah. Uh, one, I felt like you didn't see it enough. Two, I feel like is the right number, and even then, like it's weird. If I could play one and a half copies of this card, I would, because at one, I don't feel like I ever see it. At two, I feel like I always have it, and I don't like the fact that there are this many extra cards in the deck, but it is what it is. Plea for Salvation. It's World Peace, and it kills a guy that's two or less. So, yeah. It's a good card. Preemptive Strike. Green Counterspell. I think it's better than the other one, because the one with Vegeta on it, I don't remember the name uh, specifically, is because it gives your opponent the option to either bin two cards or to negate the summon. If your opponent's something like Kid Ku, they have an, an obscene amount of cards in their hand, so, you know, they're just going to choose the two cards, especially since they can just recoup it on a dime off of, uh, you know, the two-star ball. Like, they can literally just bin one of the two, like, you know, or, I'm sorry, the four-star ball. They can literally bin a four-star ball and then just pick it back up with Kid Ku, and it's like, okay, well, what did my, my card even do? Uh, preemptive Strike is basically just the hard negate. Um, so that's why we play this card. So yeah, this is the deck. Again, um, I don't think it's the most competitive deck, but it is an exercise in deck building and kind of reading the format, which I feel like in set seven is very important. Reading what your opponents are playing and countering is more important than trying to find the best deck in the uh, you know for the format, I feel like right now. Again, that's that's just my personal opinion. You know, if you can just read what the masses are playing, it's really easy to counter them. So I would worry about picking a deck that's strong against what you perceive other players to, uh, to be playing, rather than trying to find the next Victory Strike, uh, you know, Hirudagarn Storm, Hercule, or whatever have you, obvious Tier 1, Tier 0 deck. So yeah, guys, there is the Maiden deck profile. Have fun with it. It is a blast to play, and it is a breath of fresh air. Until next time, guys, I'll see you then. Bye-bye.